On today's episode, we are joined by Ryan Peden, head men's basketball coach at Illinois State University. We talked to Coach Peden about lessons he has learned in multiple stops in Division I basketball, developing relationships with high school coaches, finding the head coach position that fits you, and developing a plan for each player in the offseason. As always, thank you for listening to the After the Timeout podcast in partnership with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association. So, Coach, we like to start every episode with what we call the opening tip. Um, coming from Ohio State, right, and looking at the Illinois State job, I guess this is your chance to kind of promote Illinois State and give, give us a little bit about it. I mean, we have a lot of Illinois listeners, so I think they know. But why was that job appealing for you? Um, what were some of the, 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 I guess, the major selling points that they had that you're like, oh, yeah, this is a, this is a really good spot to be? Because uh, I think Illinois basketball, people know that, you know, basketball jobs in Illinois are really good, really good spots. So what, what was the appealing about the Illinois state job for you? Well, um, first of all, great to be with you guys. Appreciate you having, having me on, uh, and, uh, and sharing today. Um, you know, I was, um, born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. So, um, me being at Ohio state and being able to coach there for five years, I was very happy there. Um, I don't want to use the word comfortable, but I, I, cause in our profession, that's, that's, uh, that's poison. Uh, so, um, but I, I was very happy there. I loved the guy I worked for, had family and friends in the city. So for me to leave there, um, that was going to take something very special in my mind. And um, when this job did uh, come open and present itself, um, I thought, you know, let me, let me look into this one because this, this really, really piqued my interest. Um, I'd been here one time before back in 2007 when I was at Miami of Ohio and we played, played here. And I, I had a very favorable view of it, but as I began to do my research and ask around, um, uh, talk to people that knew the program and maybe had been a part of the program, um, they felt that this was a, a home run job. So that sort of solidified my, my thoughts on it and my beliefs. And I had no hesitation whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I just I think I think when you look at at Illinois State, um, number one, we've got a great academic school. You have a beautiful campus. Um, you have a town that supports basketball. This is a basketball city at a very high level. Um, uh, the the desire uh, by our fan base to to be great again is 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 very strong. And uh, from a recruiting standpoint, we can draw from a lot of different areas. You can't say that for all jobs. We can recruit from Indianapolis, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis, and the whole state of Illinois. We can recruit Indiana, um, Ohio, all through the Midwest. So um, easy to get to. I think there's a lot of built-in advantages. And then when I met the people uh, here, um, that really, really swayed me. So uh, yeah, it was, I think it's a great opportunity. And, um, you know, we got a lot of work to do, but um, really excited about being here at Illinois State. So you kind of led me right into the second part of that then, um, you know, saying you, you, you're you working and getting ready to go. Like, well, keep, share with our listeners what's your kind of vision, what, where you guys are at and where you guys are going and, and you know, maybe promote, promoting your guys a little bit, coaches, whatever it may be, um, just so our listeners, you know, coming up this basketball season can get familiar with, with Illinois State. Sure. Um, so we, we've, we've had a lot of changes in our roster since we got here uh, back in March. Um, and uh, as, as we all know, um, the fluidity of, of college basketball uh, roster management is, is at an all time high. And uh, that's a whole that's probably a whole different podcast. We could talk about talk about all that. But, um, um, you know, we've had a lot of changes, but I feel very strong and very convicted about the guys that are in our locker room now. It's important to me that um, we're recruiting guys that, um, number one, want to be here, uh, want to be at Illinois State, uh, where this means something to them. Um, I don't want to recruit guys here and um, them not feel passionately about being a part of something special here. So um, I feel really good about that. And um, and then the, the high character uh, young man, guys that will fit our uh, the mold of our DNA, what we're trying to build being tough and competitive, guys that value their academics um, and, and their pursuit of their education. 
uh, guys that want to be coached, guys that want to be a part of something special and be a part of something bigger than themselves. So those things are, it's not just coach speak. Those are things that uh, we take very seriously. Uh, we're very picky uh, uh, through the recruiting process. And to, to, to be able to do that, you have to have great assistant coaches. And I feel, I feel really good about uh, our staff. I feel great about our staff. And so they've done a great job assembling that. So, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to, to what the future holds. It's, it's, we've got a long way to go, but um, like I said, but we're, uh, we're excited about where, where this thing's headed. So before we, you know, we'll, we'll go back to a little bit about your program. Um, but, you know, we really want to talk about your journey. Um, we did see that you were in Illinois. Uh, you were the assistant to the head coach for John Gross. Um, and, and we've seen more of those type of jobs opening, whether it's, it's, it's various titles, assistant to the head coach or general manager or, you know, these, these titles that support the head coach. So kind of for our listeners, you know, maybe what does what did that position, you know, involve for you? Um, and then why do you think positions like that seem to be growing more? Well, um, you know, I think stabs are growing. Um, and, and when I first got into the business uh, at a mid-major school, if you were um, able to have a, a paid guy in the director of basketball operations position beyond just the three assistants, that was a big deal. Uh, I can remember being the first director of basketball operations at Kent State. And um, that was a big deal for me, you know, getting benefits and um, making uh, $12,000 a year at that time seemed like a lot. Um, and, and um, you know, so the, the number one uh, part of that answer, first part of that answer would be uh, the stabs are growing. So I think that's why you're seeing more support positions being created. For me, I had been an assistant for 13 years um, in the Mid-American Conference. And, and I felt like at that point in my career, I needed to make a, a jump um, out of the conference and uh, go into a different sort of family or nest, so to speak. And that's what the opportunity at Illinois uh, presented for me. So I went from a recruiting position on the road at Toledo um, to a non-recruiting and non-coaching uh, role uh, at Illinois. Um, my position at Illinois was all basketball centered. So it was a completely basketball centric position, but um, I wasn't able to technically coach on the floor or leave campus to go recruiting. So it gave me a totally different perspective um, and a different viewpoint of a, of a college basketball program. And I was able to learn from John Gross, who is a tremendous, John's a tremendous coach and even better person. And uh, he was great to me, he and his family and their staff. So um, it was very unique for me, but it was a chance for me to kind of bet on myself at that point in my career. And I think we're all presented with opportunities like like that uh, at different points in our career. And I think whether you do it or not, sort of for me, it was kind of going into neutral, you know, with my career because I wasn't going into drive and continuing forward as an assistant. I kind of was taking a little bit different path um, towards an end goal of being a head coach. And um, uh, it was, it was very beneficial two years for me and I learned a lot. And uh, I'm always appreciative of being able to coach there at Illinois. I want to, I want to tweak this one a little bit just to kind of encompass all your, your experiences so far, but uh, you mentioned your time with coach gross, uh, spent time with coach Holtman, um, a lot of other great coaches at your stops. So, I want to kind of talk about uh, one, um, maybe some of the lessons you learned from some of those coaches, and then I guess uh, adjusting at, at each spot. I always find this interesting when we talk coaches adjusting at each spot to each coach, right? Yeah, I think for you know young coaches getting in a high school job or whatever it may be, that's important skill to be able to kind of read the room, right, and know. Hey, this is what my head coach wants. Um, and when you go different places, you know, you kind of got to adjust that every time. So maybe some of the lessons you learned along the way and then kind of how to adjust each, you know, kind of where you go and, and read your head coach. Sure, Todd, that's a great point that you made um, in terms of kind of reading the room, so to speak. It is a skill, um, you know, not just for basketball, but as we go on in life, as in our professional lives, um, it's a skill to be able to uh, 
um, read a situation or a staff or a company or um, you know whatever organization that you might work for and try to figure out not only what uh, is my job description, but what does this group or this team or this room need from me? And that can be something completely different uh, if you take a new job. So you have to be able to um, adjust and adapt to uh, not only your boss, but what your staff needs from, from you or from that position. And uh, sometimes that might be different than what you're, what you're accustomed to or what you're used to. And you've got to be willing to, to, to do whatever is asked of you. Um, you know, we, we, we say this all the time in our, uh, in our program is no matter what role you have, and that can go from being a manager um, to being a support staff, to being um, our tra athletic trainer, um, we, we need everyone to be an all-star in their role. Um, we just had our uh, extended uh, staff here uh, in their families at our house on Friday night. My wife and I hosted them and um, I wanted them all to understand like how important they are to our team's success. And uh, it, it, it's like anything, if you don't take your role uh, as serious as the guy next to you, then I believe that's going to, that's going to hurt the effectiveness of your, of your overall operation. So um, it's, it's a great uh, point. And I don't mean to kind of go on a tangent there, but I think it's so vital you're talking about being a part of a team or a, a coaching staff um, to be able to kind of take pride in, in that. Um, some of the lessons that I've learned, you know, um, I worked for five different head coaches, each of them very, very uniquely different. Um, Charlie Coles was a guy that is a old, straight old school uh, coach. Um, he's passed away now, but Charlie had an unbelievable effect on my career, um, gave me a chance to get into the business and uh, taught me some lessons that um, I think as I look back are, are, are some of the most important and time-tested uh, lessons in coaching. Um, you know, trusting your instincts, um, being very convicted in your beliefs, um, not settling for anything other than um, your team's best. Um, and then the details and the minutia that is involved. He wasn't as um, probably minutia driven as some of the other coaches that I've worked for, but um, things that were important to him, everyone in that locker room knew that they were important to him. And um, um, I, I learned some really important uh, coaching and life lessons uh, there early in my career. Um, I've worked for Todd Kowalczyk at the University of Toledo, uh, a tremendous CEO, uh, the way he operates and runs his program from top to bottom, his engagement in the community with boosters and um, and then his intelligence as a basketball coach. Uh, Jimmy Christian worked for at Kent State. I've always said this about Jim. If he weren't a basketball coach, he'd be a, a world-class uh, trial lawyer. Like he, he's a high, he has high level intelligence and can get, he can sort of manipulate a room uh, to see things how he wants them to see him. And I think that's a gift. He's a, he's a tremendous coach. He's been a great mentor for me throughout my career. Uh, John Gross, consistent energy. He's bringing it every single day. He he, he approaches his job with such joy and passion. Um, he's a great coach. I know it didn't work uh, how he wanted to at, at Illinois over the course of, of, of his years there. Um, he's a high-level coach, trust me. And, and I say that from a recruiting standpoint, from an X's and O's standpoint, and from a, a, a caring for his people standpoint. Um, uh, and then working for Chris Holtman, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways that ch it just changed my changed my philosophy. Uh, being at Butler and working for him um, affected me in a lot of ways as a coach and, and my views towards the game, um, the the simplicity, the the purity of approach, uh, worrying about the things that are most essential to winning, um, not getting caught up in the minutia, not getting caught up in the the, the noise uh, or anything that doesn't really necessarily correlate to directly to winning. So he has a, a very um, simplistic approach in a lot of ways, um, but it's, it's rooted in uh, a, a very values based culture. And um, so that's, that's uh, that, you know, and then and going to Ohio state with him, I was with him for seven years. And, uh, you know, I think I carry so much of, of what we were a part of in those seven years here to our new program at Illinois state. 
So I wanted to follow up with something similar to the uh, we talked about reading the room as assistant coach. I guess how do you help your players kind of with that skill and and being able to adapt to different whether it be in the classroom, right? Um, you know, a lot of players are going to go in the the business world or teaching or or whatever whatever they may be. So how do you help your players kind of develop that skill of of communicating and and, and working with different people? Because I, I I personally think just me, John, our teachers that kind of little bit during COVID, right? It got, it got difficult. And then kids kind of, with the, you know, high school kids coming in as freshmen, um, you know, the way we communicate was a little bit different for a while. So how do you help kids kind of develop that skill, you know, in person and with different people? Sure. Well, I, th I think, um, I think being able to define what you want out of them. Okay. And how you view things. Cause your views as a coach may be different than mine and what I value may be different than yours. And that's, that's fine. But I think you've got to, first of all, have an understanding as a leader, um, what is important to me? Um, how do I want these guys to communicate? How do I want them to listen? Um, how do I want them to retain? You know, do I, do I quiz them? Do I uh, follow up? Do I continue to go back and hammer on these points that are most important to me? You've got to be able to define that as a leader. What what's the most? What are some of the most important things to me? Um, secondly, you got to show them, um, define it first, and then you got to be able to show them and demonstrate what that looks like. Um, and however you do that, it very we, we use YouTube a lot. To be honest with you, and we we've got some life skills classes that we teach beyond um, just basketball in our practices. I want our players to grow as, as people. It's just as important to us as a staff. And uh, we use YouTube videos a lot. Try to give examples of real world um, uh, comparisons or real world uh, examples of um, maybe what I'm talking about, you know, um, maybe things that have happened, uh, uh, adversities that people have faced. We had a topic the other night, adversity, resilience, and grit, and showing professional athletes or or guys they can relate to um, and examples of, of how they've been through difficult times and how they've handled that. Um, so I think, I think being able to show them and, and then support it um, with, with uh, facts and evidence that, Hey, th this is true. You know, this is true. This is, this is how we have to be. And uh, if I want to be like Kobe, uh, I've got to learn some va very valuable lessons from, from Kobe. And uh that's why I think YouTube's a really valuable resource for that. Um, and there's a lot of nonsense on there too. You got to sift through it, but um, that's, that's a way that I try to support uh, my arguments is with real examples and in a visual way. All right. And I think, I think that's important coach because you're using tools that the kids already use on an everyday basis to right. communicate. Um, so we wanted to kind of transition a little bit over to the recruiting side in the state of Illinois. And we, we talked to lots of, of college coaches and you always hear from college coaches, you know, win your state, win the, win the recruits in your state. So what are some things that are important for you when working with the local high school coaches first? Let's kind of just talk about that. Maybe the connections with the local high school coaches. Well, I think first, uh, for me coming in, um, you know, I, I was fortunate because I had two years at Illinois. So there were a, a good amount of high school coaches and coaches in our region that I did know. Um, I don't know them probably as well as I did uh, the coaches in Ohio, because I'd been in Ohio for almost 20 years of my professional life. But um, first of all, I think you got to reach out to them. <laughs> um, and um, that's that's important to me. The, the, the relationship piece is... Um, it's not real complicated. You know, I, th I think, um, you know, effort, it requires effort. Um, it requires a one-on-one -on -one communication and connecting with them as a person. And they understand having them understand your, your vision for the program. So I've tried to do that as much as I possibly can. Um, and sometimes that's cold calling, you know, that's guys that you, you don't know, um, haven't met, but that you want to build a relationship with. Um, and then the, our, our local coaches, I try to reach out to them and invite them to our practices as, as much as uh, I can, just to let them know, like, hey, not all, I'm not just saying it, like I'm following up, 
I want you to be in our gym and, and I would love for you to, you know, take a thing or two maybe from us and maybe we can take a thing or two from you and learn from one another. So, um, you know, I think building the relationships there, I, we have so much respect for the coaches in this region. It, it's, 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 a you know, I'm a product of the Midwest. I've been here my whole life. I was born and raised. So I do have a certain level of conviction in, um, basketball and the coaching that that occurs in our region and uh, I'm, I'm very uh, excited to be at Illinois State and be surrounded by great coaches and especially in our state and uh, we're going to be picky uh, through our recruiting um, we'll never we'll never apologize for that so it's not to say hey we're going to take every good player or try to take every good player or offer everyone from our state just because they're good um, they've got to fit um, they've got to fit our locker room and what we're looking for as well. But that's our job to, to, to figure that part of it out. And I think it, again, it starts with relationship building from the ground up. Well, you kind of just led me into my next question, which was, you kind of talked about some things you were looking for in, uh, in players, you know, with, with communication, but, you know, when you're recruiting a player, how do you know this is someone that fits what you want to do at Illinois state? Well, I think there's a lot that goes into it. There's a there's a vetting process that we have, and and and, and obviously a big part of that is um, evaluating their basketball talent. Um, we wouldn't be talking to them if um, if if they weren't uh, talented. But um, there's so much that we uh, that goes into that. So uh, we have we have different uh, areas that we look at and evaluate. Um, just from a basketball standpoint, I would tell you um, guys uh, that are good teammates. Uh, that is really important to us. And, you know, we can evaluate on film um, and that's helpful, but uh, there's no evaluation tool for us better than being in person at a game when we can see uh, when a guy is struggling and how he responds to adversity and uh, how he responds to his teammates in those moments and how coachable he is. And um, those are all things um, that we that we look at. Um, uh, guys that are tough and competitive, that, that's, that's a, that's a, a phrase that is used, uh, you know, a lot in our office. Is he tough and is he competitive? Um, we value skill from a basketball standpoint, um, you know, over just pure athleticism and then, uh, really versatility, um, in their games. And, and, uh, you know, I think uh, sometimes talent, uh, in the, at the high school level can be masked a little bit. Um, you know, by their level of development, physically and basketball wise. Um, so we're trying to evaluate where their ceiling is as well. If we feel like it's a guy that has a high ceiling and a lot of room for growth, that's really attractive to us as long as uh, the player sees that and understands that and buys into it as well. So um, guys that want to be coached and uh, guys that want to be developed uh, at a high level, I think those are all characteristics that we look for, you know, from a basketball standpoint. So this is a, I have a quick follow-up. This is a very yeah. Todd question. I'm going to steal a Todd question. I know he's, I know I've heard him ask guests before, you know, everybody is looking for toughness. Everybody's looking for, you know, the grit. How do you, how do you guys measure that? Whether it be in practice in games or their stats or different kinds of things you're looking for or attributes to kind of measure that toughness. So I think so much of toughness is, there's a physical element to it. And I think that's maybe a, a very simplistic view of, of what uh, toughness actually is. You know, I think in, in, in so many ways, toughness is your ability to respond to adversity and uh, how well you can do that uh, in adverse situations. You know, um, there's many definitions out there, but um, being able to consistently do the right things um, regardless of circumstance, that that's uh, to us in a lot of ways how we view toughness. Can can I consistently do my job, make the right play, um, uh, play the way that our program needs me to, regardless of circumstance? And that requires a an ability, uh, you know, a significant ability to have uh, that mental fortitude and the mental makeup um, to be able to do that. And um, that's. That's certainly not something that we're born with. Um, you know, that's a that's a skill. That's a skill that's uh, you know a lot a lot goes into that. So uh, that's that's how we would define toughness. Um, the things that we look for, 
I, I love being at games where it's tough for high school players, you know, um, seeing them respond in, in adverse situations, in really difficult circumstances. I think that's when um, you learn the most about a player. You know, they say adversity reveals character in, in a lot of ways. That's uh, true, even as you carry it onto the basketball court, because it, it re, it's very revealing for us. And in those moments, you're able to learn, I think, the most about about players and how they respond in, in those moments. So I want to go back for a second here to kind of your path. You mentioned all the great coaches you worked for, your stops along the way. Um, and, and I think this is one of our, John and I's kind of favorite questions for a lot of coaches because I think it's so important. Um, it's kind of a two-parter here. Uh, yeah. One, what, are, what were the challenges, that, you know, as a young coach and then, you know, now you're getting older, families, relationships, things like that of, you know, being a college coach and, hey, I'm here now and I'm here now um, and, and kind of how to deal with that and find the balance, right, of, yeah, this is my profession, but I also have to have, you know, my family life and and friends and, and things like that. So what were some of the challenges, you know, coming from a young coach, sure. uh, as a young coach, kind of taking those paths different directions? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of challenges. That's a great point. Um, and and while your your career may be taking shape and growing, uh, your 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 life away from the office or the basketball court um is changing constantly right so i went from being a single guy to where i didn't have to uh, worry about um anything other than just working and doing really essentially doing what i wanted to do away from the basketball court or away from the office to then having a wife and then having a child and um i think you have to be uh, grounded as an individual to understand uh, number one what's important to you uh, what kind of person do you want to be? What kind of husband do you want to be? What kind of father do you want to be? And um, be very convicted in that. Um, and that was a learning process, to be honest, because um, balance, life balance, work-life balance has not ever been one of my personal strengths. And I've had to uh, sort of take a real introspective uh, view uh, myself at times because, um, you know, um, you, I can get... I can get tied up and, and just working. And um, I think the older you get, you realize a, no, a, that's not healthy. Uh, and B um, you know, if you, if you are serious about being a, a, a great father and a great husband and um, making your family important to your overall life, you've got to, you got to pour into those areas. And um, it's a constant for me. That's a constant uh, that's a constant battle that I'm, that I'm always working at. So I'm imperfect uh, in that area for sure. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think uh, hopefully that answers, answers your question, but I, I think that's something we, you got to be grounded in terms of understanding who you are and what you want to be. And then, um, you know, constantly self-evaluate to, to see like, Hey, am I, am I, are my actions indicating that um, what I really want to be? And, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm a work in progress in that area for sure. So second part of that question is, uh, you know, obviously you're in Illinois, uh, John and I had talked about this in the spring about just this year, it, it, whether it's high school or college, it seemed to be that there's just a lot of change. Uh, like you said, coaches saying, Hey, I'm just going to be with my family or, or whatever. Um, so I guess advice for, for young coaches, coaches trying to move up the ranks in the profession, whether it be from a freshman coach to uh, maybe a varsity assistant or, you know, that varsity assistant to a head coach or even somebody who wants to try to work their way in, into the college ranks. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about just just that that process and, and trying to advance advance your career and, and some of the things, maybe the key things you were successful in doing that could help some of our coaches that are listening? Sure. So I think I think at the root of uh, of this answer is the word relationships. And um, again, it does not matter what profession that you're in. Um, relationships are going to drive the trajectory of your career. And, and I think there's very, very few um, circumstances where that's not true. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's probably 
equally as important in most all other professions. So every every job or every opportunity that I've gotten along the way where I you know may have gotten a little bit uh, higher on the totem pole and worked my way up uh, was a result of a relationship that I had with someone who helped me uh, to get my foot in the door with that job. And uh, relationships uh, will drive your growth in, in this profession for sure. So I think um, as a young coach, my, my advice would be to identify what is your end goal? You know, I realize that can change over time. What's your end goal? What's your, what is your, what's your, uh, you know, what is your goal uh, in terms of your career? Where do you see this going? What do you want from uh, your professional career? And then work towards becoming that. You've got to be great at where you're at regardless. Okay. Um, you're not going to advance in the business because you're always thinking about the next job. So you've got to be great where you're at, be where your feet are. Okay. But um, if I, my goal is to be a head varsity coach, then I need to, um, I need to continue to expand my network with head varsity coaches, um, learn from them, evaluate them, observe them, go to their practices and their games. And I think being face to face in this day and age, um, it's even more important. Um, and I tell young coaches that want to get into the college game, I say, come to a practice, man, or uh, extend yourself, uh, call them and see if you can go to a game. And just the eyeball to eyeball communication, um, it's, I think it's, it's one of those things that's, that is time tested. And um, you, 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 you can never, it's easier now to, for me to communicate with you via text or email or any form of communication, DMs. Uh, we couldn't do that back in the day. So it's become easier to communicate from afar. I don't believe that's that's the best way to, to do that and build true authentic relationships. So I think um, you got to identify where you want to go. I think you got to be able to talk to people that can help you get there to build your own network. Remember that you got to be great where you are be where your feet are, and then continue to expand uh, your network and, and the relationships that you do have as you go along in your profession. All right. So as Todd and I go forward, we stop in the middle of the episode a little bit and, and do do like a basketball situation. We call it halftime adjustments. Great. Um, so the, your situation, uh, your team's up three. There's seven seconds to go. Your opponent has to go the 94 feet. Um, you're in the bonus, so your opponent would get one and one free throws if you foul. So my question for you is up three, seven seconds to go, got to go 94 feet. Are you playing it out or are you fouling? We're fouling. Yeah, we're fouling. And here's why. Um, you know, I know there's a scenario where they make a free throw and then um, they kick it out and they can hit a three and then they can beat you. I look at it very simplistically. Um, if we don't foul, they've got to do one thing. They got to go down the floor and make a three. And you and I both know there's 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 so many crazy shots that have happened where the defense might have been perfect. Um, and and uh, that that's one circumstance that has to happen. Okay, if we foul, there's about four things that have to happen. Number one, they have to make the first free throw. Number two, they've got to be able to overpower our guys or get an angle on the box out which we're not going to allow to happen. Um, number three, they've got to get a tip out. Uh, number four, they've got to tip out to one of their teammates. And number five, so it's five circumstances, uh, they got to make the shot. So that's the way uh, I look at it. And, um, you know, I do think in talking about this, because I think the offenses, that offensive players are getting smarter. You see this a lot in the NBA at drawing fouls and, and flopping or faking as a team reaches in, okay? Um, and I think part of that is the offensive player can see the defense, what they're doing, and they can see it coming. I may be going in to foul real hard or grab his jersey. I think there's a technique to fouling in those situations, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think you got to play the game. And when I say that, they're going to have to advance the ball up. So we're going to be in a situation where I'm side by side with my guy or maybe giving away an angle of some sort. But if I can reach across his body in a sort of a very natural way where he thinks I'm reaching for the ball, but I'm actually reaching for the ball, but I'm actually reaching to get a foul. 
okay? And I'm reaching across my body, across his hip, and really fouling him. Um, I think it's less, those, those moments, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm overanalyzing this, but uh, I do think there's a technique to um, fouling late in those situations and not looking like it to give that away to the offense. That was before I turn over to Todd. That was my favorite halftime adjustments answer I think we ever had right there. <laughs> well, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just, I, 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 we've all seen, you know, it, you've seen it go both ways. I realize sometimes people foul and they, they end up losing the game, but um, that's my thinking behind it. And uh, it's kind of a simplistic view, uh, but um, I just, I think there's a lot more that has to happen um, in those situations where you foul. Hey, well, I even look at it too is like missing a free throw on purpose isn't really that easy. Like that's not something like, you really practice, right? right. You don't yeah. you don't practice like missing a free. You don't tell your players, hey, we're gonna practice missing free throws. Right. Right. Um, you know, I don't know how many times as a coach you're doing a shooting drill and you're like, hey, they're like, miss, we got a rebound, you know, and you you know, <laughs> you, you know, you know, not the greatest shooter ever, but you, you can still make it, right? Because it's just yep. kind of habit. So um, so we wanted to move on uh when we were kind of you know, kind of doing our research, um, we saw you were involved in Coaches for Change. Yep. Um, so we just want to give you the opportunity to kind of share with our listeners what Coaches for Change is and then, you know, maybe, you know, how coaches can get involved or 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 kind of, you know, uh, look into that, that, that organization and, and help. Yeah, it's been it's been uh, that's been something that was very meaningful. Um, it was sort of created um, in the. Um, quarantine you know and uh there was a lot as we all know there was a lot of things going on in our world at that time from a social injustice racial injustice standpoint and um what we did was uh we we're part of we had a core group of coaches it was led uh by the head coach at Siena you know, University and or Siena College I guess and um uh, th it was it was it, it was awesome how it sort of take took shape and um, how many people jumped on board. But um, you know more than anything, it's a group of coaches coming together to per to help um, get the word out and 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 really extend ourselves in the pursuit of equality, um, injustice, equity, um, and making make a change and help to make a change amongst. Uh, people in our communities, in our basketball communities, in our campus communities, and in our in our you know rural communities as well. So um, it's it was uh, something very beneficial. There is a website if anyone would like to check it out. Coaches for Change, the number four. So Coaches for Change, and there's there's a lot of uh, educational resources and tools on there that uh, can educate. That was a big thing we wanted to do was to educate. Um, we were we were a driving force behind getting uh, all uh, college basketball teams registered to vote, um, educating uh, our players and our communities about um, certain issues, and um, you know it was a great opportunity for me to be a part of something that was uh, you know le leading uh, in our in our little world, um, helping to do what we could to to lead young people. So. Um, and we will definitely, you know, anything you need us to ever promote on that coach, we'll, we will retweet it. Uh, we'll send out the website. Uh, I think, cause I think that's so important. Um, you know, everybody comes from different places and, and, and realizing we might not agree, but we can understand where everybody come from and try to find a way to make it work and, and, and make it good for everyone. So I, I think that's so important. Um, so I wanted to get into like, off season preparation a little bit here now kind of kind of back to the the prep that season coming up um and, and specifically for player but when you're developing a like an off season plan for your players right season ends this is the result this is what this player did um first and foremost how do you kind of go about developing that plan what are some of the key things you're looking at well our, our view of development may be a, a little different um, than most. It's, it's a, we, we take a, a four pronged approach and uh, we look at uh, development as very holistic, um, developing our, peop our, our players as people, um, as players, as students, and as athletes. And when we're talking about development, um, you know, I think most kids are probably most interested in the basketball development. I think that's fair to say, that's obvious. 
um, but um, we believe they're all four are very interconnected. And um, we it's our job as coaches during these formative years of their lives, right, 18 to 22 year olds um, and the changes and the growth that they're going to have in so many areas um, that we really zero in on developing them in those four areas. That's our approach. Um, so we evaluate each of those categories um, very uh, in depth. And uh, we've got uh, many things that we do throughout the season and in the off season, especially um, programs and systems that are implemented um, to to help them grow in those areas. But there's an evaluation aspect that uh, is constant throughout the year. We'll certainly sit down with each of our players after the season and take a 10,000 foot view of the year and how that went for them. But, but um, our approach in those four areas um, we, we just view that all, all four are equally important. Um, I, 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 there, there's examples out there, but there's very few that are highly uh, uh, detailed on the floor and uh, extremely non-detailed off the floor academically. That's not a formula, a consistent formula for success. It's not. Um, uh, our belief is that um, high achievers uh, off the floor will equate to high achievers on, on the floor. And there's areas of your life that you've got to have in order. Um, and that's where our, our development model sort of uh, is rooted in. That's what it's rooted in. So um, hopefully answers you know your question without going into too much detail on that, but um, just kind of our approach and how we how we view that. You know, I wanted to, to hit on a follow up and there was something we, we had spoken to uh, Mike Bailey, the coach of St. Pat's High School uh, for our last episode. And he kind of talked about making changes, um, whether it be X's and O's changes or, you know, a, a change the way you play defense or uh, switch something offensively. And he kind of talked about the process for him and his staff, maybe taking two to three years to really understand what you want to do before you make the changes. For your your staff, your players, your program, when you go about, you see something new that you like or new that another team does that you want to implement, can you kind of just take us through on the collegiate level, maybe the process you and your staff go through to maybe implement something new in the off season um, going into another new season? Yeah, that, it's, it's a great question. I think that, um, first of all, um, for me starting out, I'm, I'm operating from uh, a position where this is uh, this is our first year. So where everything we are implementing is new. And a piece of advice that, that my former boss gave me, and I've actually heard this from a handful of guys that, that are head coaches, is they said, my advice for you in year one is coach what you know. Okay, don't try to, uh, you know, add all these things that you've wanted to do or that you admire or that you think will work. And uh, then you look up and you, you don't really have the level of experience with those, with those things as you're going into battle for the first time as a staff and as a program. So implementing things for us right now that we know and that we believe in and that we're convicted in, I think that's my starting base and my starting point as we're building this uh, foundation is we've got to start from being really, really effective in the areas that we feel most convicted about and uh, being able to, to translate that to our players. Now, unfortunately, college coaches don't have two or three years uh, to, to, to uh, implement and see those changes take effect. We've got to be able to, uh, there's a balance because you, you want to be uh, flexible and you want to grow. And there's things certainly that we're going to change and modify as we go along, but we've got to be able to be simplistic enough um, that, and this is my view, but uh, uh, simplistic enough that um, you can uh, implement those changes in a fairly expeditious way um, so that your players can pick them up and that they can, um, you know, put them to use on the floor. So um, I'll always err on the side of simplicity. I think, uh, you know, some of the ways that we've done things at Ohio State and and Butler um, are rooted in in simplicity over complexity. Um, I've always admired the Villanova program uh, from afar, and and we've competed against them many times. I think it's one of the uh, most uh, simple uh, offensive and defensive uh, uh, schemes that you'll find in college basketball. But they're damn good, and they're really commit 
con committed to being great in those areas and uh, that they deem important. So um, that's sort of my my viewpoint. And I think that we're going to have to take that into account in this era because uh, of the changeover in, in rosters from year to year. So you're talking about four to six new guys potentially every single year. Um, you can't change things completely. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. And um, I think that that's a skill as a coach. Uh, and I think we've got to be willing to kind of um, adapt and, and, and move uh, as quickly as possible. So I want to kind of take that concept a step further than um, with staff, right? The college yeah. level, you have director of basketball operations, assistant coaches, trainers, uh, nutrition, strength and conditioning coaches. So you're taking that simplicity, but how, as a head coach, are you filtering that down to make sure, Hey, we're all on the same page. Uh, what, you know, what resources are you giving your coaches? What kind of things are you working on as a staff to be, Hey, we're a united front on this. Um, and, and yeah, you obviously you're at the college level, but I think that's important for high school levels too, right? Your sophomores, your freshmen, your, your junior high teams, things like that. Sure. So I think you have to, I'm learning this too, as, as I go along is uh, especially as you're implementing a new program is you can't take anything for granted, right? Uh, I have a staff that is awesome, um, but I have to constantly define what I want that to look like. Um, it hasn't been, uh, the wheels haven't been in motion for five or 10 years here. We're starting a new program here. So I have to constantly define that. It requires a, probably a little bit more patience in um, micromanaging than I would, I would, you know, normally like to have. But um, I think it's essential as you're building a program, you've got to be able to define not just to your players, but to your staff, to your support staff. Um, to all those around you, from your medical staff to your academic team to your nutrition, uh, what you want it to look like. I'm learning that. Um, and uh, you've got to be very, very aligned and connected um, so that your players are uh, receiving a consistent message. And uh, so you got to be intentional about it. Again, it goes back to that uh, element of communication that we've talked about throughout this. Uh, uh, as, as a head coach and um, as a program, uh, you you have to have a high level communication to be able to relay to people around you and the players that play for you um, how you want it done, and uh, and then then sort of go from there. But yeah, I think that's 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 probably an underrated um, concept or value that um, all coaches uh, have to have as they're as they're building their program. And so we want to transition here to our, our last two segments. First one, 30 second timeout. Um, your chance to talk about anything, uh, any subject you want. It could be basketball related, non basketball related, um, something that's important, important to you. Uh, you want our listeners to know about. Um, very loose 30 seconds. <laughs> you really have all the time you want to talk about well, it. Well, sure. I'll say this. Um, and and, and uh, I, this is cool that you do this uh, segment. I think, um, I think so much of. It's a point I made to our team in the last few days, but I think this is a, a good, it's a good message is um, how you choose to look at uh, your situation or how you choose to look at your program or how you choose to look at anything in life. Um, it all originates from here, right? And uh, your mind controls the way that you view things. Your mind controls uh, the actions uh, that your, that your body uh is, is actually physically going to do or not do, uh, whether that's as an athlete or an executive or as a head coach or as an assistant coach. Um, so I think so much of um, our sport and sport in general is how you choose to view things. And uh, mindset is so important. Um, and that's why being a positive, upbeat and energetic person, um, not ignoring reality, but also not dwelling on um, things that are going to pull you down or, you know, make you negative uh, or, um, you know, you're, you're going to steal energy from your group. Um, your, your mindset controls all that. And um, I just think it's such an underrated um, value. And I, I was just reading a book, you know, Jay Wright talks about, um, former Villanova coach talks about attitude. 
and it's all about their attitude and their response to difficult things. And um, his way of training uh, the minds of those in his program is, is, is so underrated. He's a great coach. Um, he's a legendary coach. He's a hall of fame coach, but I think his ability to train uh, his mind and his players' minds um, dictated so much of their long-term success. And uh, I, I think it's just an area that we all, you know, owe it to ourselves to, to really dial into. If you're, if you're serious about being great, uh, very few, um, energy takers, or they call them energy vampires, um, are ever, ex uh, it's highly successful for extended periods of time, at least in our world in college basketball. So your mindset uh, controls so much of your success. And, uh, I think that's a, that's, that'd be a, that'd be a, that's my quick message for the day. Oh, and I, I think just mind, like you said, mindset in anything you do is important. I think, you know, no matter what your job, uh, that's important. Um, all right. So the last segment we call quick hitters, um, quick hitters is sometimes basketball related. Sometimes they're just fun, either or questions that Todd and I come up with, just have a little fun with our guests before the end of the episode. Um, so first quick hitter for you, maybe a, your favorite underrated part of living in Bloomington, Illinois. Restaurants. I would say restaurants. They're the per capita. Uh, this has got to be one of the tops in the state of Illinois. Restaurants per capita uh, for population. I think we've got great food here. We've got great restaurants. There's a mixture of chains and uh, mom and pop type of restaurants. And I, I, I love uh, the restaurant scene here in Bloomington Normal. Uh, I guess maybe the best or maybe worst team flight story. Team flight? Yeah. Uh, okay, that was easy. Uh, Butler University, this is 2015-16 season. I think it's right after the new year. We're flying home uh, from St. John's mid-flight. Um, flying home, this is, this is uh, mid-flight. We're over Pennsylvania, and um, it started getting a little bit cold on the plane. And the oxygen mask, boom, dropped. As soon as they dropped, all the lights went out and our plane was rapidly descending. And in those moments, I was just actually talking about this a couple of nights ago. We were, we were sharing stories. And, uh, and that was a moment for me that um, I'd never been in before and uh, hope to never be in again. But uh, we, we, we thought we were going down. And uh, the rapid descent was, I learned later, was that the, the oxygen pressure had gone out in the aircraft and they had to get that below 10,000 feet as quickly as possible. Once you're below 10,000 feet, the pressurization is not needed. Um, but uh, it was really scary. I had to make an emergency landing in Pittsburgh. We made it, but uh, something I never have to, ho hopefully have never have to go through again. All right, so this one, this one is hopefully a little uh, less, uh, a little lighter. <laughs> yeah, um, sorry, sorry about that. No, that's a that's an intense one. Um, <laughs> it was we intense. Were, we were wondering maybe a story you remember from your playing days, from either a, a hard practice or a tough practice, or maybe a goofy story from practice. Something you remember? My, um, this was my junior year at the, the College of Worcester. We played in a holiday tournament up in uh, Cal Kalamazoo College up in Michigan. And uh, I think we won the first night. And the second night, we played terrible and got beat by Kalamazoo. And our coach was not happy. And we were, it was a treat for us to do this. We stayed another night and then practiced the next day on Michigan State's floor. So we were practicing right after they were done with practice. And, you know, for a Division three team to practice on at the Breslin was a huge deal and uh, ours was coming off of a loss and I remember you know their team walking off the floor and our coaches bringing out trash cans to the floor and we just did running drill after running drill after running drill for like an hour and a half and we had guys puking all over the place in in the Breslin Center in the trash cans and uh, he brought us in the locker room afterwards and let us have it and and we deserved it but um, it's one of those ones that, you know, I think th those moments, um, we all have those, you know, you don't forget those. And uh, those are seared in my mind and it changed our 
mindset again and our behavior uh, right away and got our season back on track. But um, yeah, I remember, I remember about half our team puking in the Breslin Center um, after <laughs> after we we uh, we had a letdown uh, the night before. All right, uh, you're you're on campus, not non basketball, right? Um, your your favorite college sport to go watch on, on their campus. What what are you what are you watching? Like if you're gonna go out, you're on campus that day, picking up a game. What are you gonna see? Easy. That's college football. Uh, I love it. This is this is if you're a college basketball player, this is an unbelievable time of year. Uh, other than your season when you're competing, I love this because there's a there's a uh, they're just a feeling around campus. Uh, it's in the air, you know, that fall feeling in the air. Um, there's an energy on campus as the students come back, um, being able to go out and experience uh, the college football environment and atmosphere is awesome. And uh, I'm a big college football fan anyway. So um, college game day coming on and all of that. I, I, I enjoy that and, and, and love that part of the, uh, the collegiate experience. All right, so last one, and, and you can maybe give us uh, your favorite, but are you a sweet snacks guy or a salty snacks guy? Oh, probably both. Um, I Probably both. I, I have a sweet tooth, and it gets me late at night, usually when you're tired, and um, I like ice cream late at night. That's like my, you know, I don't have any any bad uh vices that I that I turn to but that would that's probably one uh, you know that is probably the one that I do have is I ice cream late at night and that gets me so I gotta watch my discipline uh with that but yeah I'm I, I'm, I would definitely have a sweet tooth um uh, that gets me late at night usually all right then what's your go-to ice cream flavor then yeah usually well my favorite one the worst the worst now my wife will get uh cookie dough uh a lot and mm -hmm. uh, always have that for whatever reason has that in the uh, freezer so i end up eating that um but my my favorite is a birthday cake yeah birthday cake yeah yeah that's that's my that's favorite good mix of everything yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's so but i yeah i don't really right. discriminate either too much <laughs> I get I'm, can, hey we're work in progress right like yeah, yeah growth minded i gotta get better with that so i'm working on it Coach, we uh, we really do appreciate you jumping on. Um, I've already sent some some tweets out about Coaches for Change, but uh, listeners, you know, make sure you you look at the Coaches for Change platform and what they stand for. And um, Illinois uh, coaches, I believe, coach will be at the statewide coaches clinic coming up. Yes, so, coming up uh, coming up later this month. Yeah, I'm looking forward looking forward to that and 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 uh, seeing the old friends and and meeting new ones. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, looking forward to that for sure here in a couple of weeks. So coaches, please make sure you, you jump out and see coach and, and check out some Illinois State basketball. Coach, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast in concert with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association. Please remember to give us a five-star rating wherever you may listen. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout and subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.